Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. I'm so excited to be joined by my dear friend and unknowing client, Fran. We met at a boutique law firm where Fran was one of the lawyers I worked with, and we became fast friends. And when I say fast, I mean fast. We have worked together over the years professionally, but also have a beautiful friendship. Fran, I'm so grateful that you've joined me here today on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking about you, your journey, your academic life, your professional life, and the twists and turns that you've taken to get to this place. So let's start out with you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got here. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Fran, and I am an in-house insurance defense lawyer with an insurance company. I enjoy dealing with all kinds of litigation, and that's what I've been doing for the last just over two and a half years. But you've been a lawyer for since when? Yes. So I was called to the Bar of Ontario in 2017. In July. So I will be coming up to year five almost of practice. Okay. Now let's just pause for one second because I remember your call to the bar day because you weren't at work that day, obviously. And I remember that I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so exciting for you. And so I drew with like, I went into your office. I got some highlighters. (laughs) I remember this. (laughs) And I wrote congratulations on a piece of paper and I took a picture and sent it to you. I was so excited for you on that day. So we met when you were articling. Yeah, I remember. I will never forget that day. I had actually been called in after the interview that you had with the managing partner at the time. I had been called in to his office. He told me, listen, we found, I found an excellent, excellent student who's going to be joining us. And I remember just thinking he, he then decided to elaborate on your resume. And just at the time where we were working, I remember thinking, how did we get this kind of caliber of student to begin with? But really, yeah, we, it, it seems like a lifetime ago, but really it wasn't actually that long. But, you know, I always say it was meant to be. It was meant to be that we crossed paths and it's like everyone says, the rest is history. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh my. And, and. We're going to get way more into that history as we go. But take me back to what you did before you applied to law school. Yeah, I did my undergrad at York University. I was a criminology major. It's funny. I remember sitting in that first year lecture in Curtis lecture for any of you that are listening in from York. And I remember sitting in this class and the professor at the time had told, had made a joke actually that, okay, well, I guess half of you are intending to go to law school and the other half of you are either deciding to do some kind of policy or some kind of policing future. And it's, it's so funny because I remember at the time I had enrolled in criminology with intention of pursuing law school and thoroughly enjoyed my time, loved the class, loved everything about the the program. And graduation basically came in what felt like a lifetime, but really it was only a few years later. And I mean, I'm one of those, you know, I say it's so cheesy, but I remember being in grade school. I was in elementary school, I think it was grade six civics. And I remember learning about the court system. And it was that class that I I remember sitting back saying, that's it. That's what I want to do. One day far down the road, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a judge. What's a prerequisite to be a judge? Definitely a lawyer. Always liked it. I definitely enjoyed any kind of debates that we could do in classes. And it just continued. It just continued from there. And in undergrad, that was definitely still a passion and took me to that stage where applications were looming and it was time to, you know, get down to it. (laughs) Yeah. So this is so great, I think, to raise because your path to becoming a lawyer began with you at a very young age, knowing that you wanted to become a lawyer. Whereas for me, it came much later, like while I was in graduate school. So I think that it's just so valuable to raise that everybody has different paths 
And we met, we're both lawyers now. We met at a law firm, but that's not where I ever expected myself to be before thinking of applying to law school. Like it wasn't even a thought in my mind. And I speak about this in episode two. And so first of all, it's everyone has a different journey. And second of all, it's not a straight line. That's putting it mildly. (laughs) So tell me about your winding path. Sure. Yeah. So definitely not a straight line. I would say turns at every corner. So taking it back to undergrad, I'm in undergrad. I am in my last year and I decided to write that beast known as the LSAT. Wrote the LSAT, was not happy with my first score, canceled the score, knew that I had to write it again in that time. While I was studying, I had graduated and I really wanted to get into and really be immersed in a law firm. I had applied to absolutely so many different opportunities. I remember feeling a little bit, you know, disheartened only because so many of the applications were thank you so much for your interest, but we do require someone with some experience in, you know, some kind of either as an admin role or something. At the time I was applying as a legal assistant. And I remember thinking, just to let me come to your firm and I will show you, you know, I'm probably one of the most driven people you've ever met. I promise I will work harder than anyone. And it's funny to think back, but I remember that was the plan. It was let me work in a law firm. Let me really see what this is all about while I'm studying. And, you know, that's the end goal. Uh, I remember I was I was very fortunate. I got a an awesome opportunity to work in a boutique firm. And at that time, I then was studying. I rewrote the LSAT and then came the journey of applying to law school. And from there, the really the road continues to be winding. I had applied once. I was not successful and I ended up applying again. Then I was admitted. I got the best mail you can ever receive is that acceptance envelope. And I ended up at the University of Ottawa. And after that, there's more twists and turns in terms of, you know, where I ended up as an articling student, as a summer student, ended up changing from one boutique firm to another, and then ended up actually changing career paths where I used to work. If you think of a boardroom table, there's two sides, the long sides of the table. I basically swapped from the one side of the table and in a lawsuit defending, representing the one party to swapping over to the other side of the of the boardroom table where now you're defending the party. So really the, the journey continued and I'm now presently in that role since, you know, really my career path kind of took a change. Yeah. And we're going to get into that. I want to take a quick step back and I want to talk about the LSAT and I want to talk about applying. And the reason that I want to talk about this is because you and I both wrote the LSAT. You and I both applied to law school twice. And for some reason, this is a point that a lot of people are embarrassed by, that they had to write the LSAT twice or the MCAT twice, or they had to apply to their program twice. And so I just want to take a moment to say, like, first of all, it's okay. Lots of people do it. You're not alone. If you're out there and you're applying two, three, four times, I know people who have applied to programs nine times before they got in. So it is not something to be embarrassed about. It's not something to be sad about or discouraged by. You just have to make sure that it is truly what you want to do. And if it is, you keep working towards it. You keep advancing along the way. So I really want to thank you for a moment just for being honest about that. Because I'm more than happy to to talk about my experience writing the LSAT twice and and we will have a future episode on LSAT. Maybe Fran will join us again for that one. (laughs) And about applying twice and and the fact that it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's part of the path. No, and and actually it's it's funny, you know, sometimes thinking about it, I remember You know, even along the way, especially as students, even before you're in that next stage, whatever that stage is, you know, sometimes it's almost like you have this idea that you have your end goal and you know where you want to go, but it's almost like there's a respectable or an appropriate way to get there. And that's the straight path. And I remember myself personally, definitely in terms of the LSAT. I mean, I wrote with a schoolmate and we both wrote together. And I remember she was able to get an incredible score first shot. And that was the plan. That's always what the plan was. You write once, you do it great, and you get in immediately. And that's not how life works. And it's actually so 
common. And, and I, I love that you even say, you know, someone that, you know, it took multiple times. And the one message I remember, and, and I've said openly to people who have met me along the way, even when we were working together, that's one of, I think, the first things we chatted about was it doesn't matter how many times. I mean, when this is the goal, this is the end game. And people used to sometimes ask me, oh, Fran, Fran I don't know how you keep doing it. Like, don't you just want to, that's it. Like, it's fine. I'll just go to plan B. And I laugh now because I used to say it so with so much intent that there is no plan B. I was going to be a lawyer and okay, it didn't happen first shot. It didn't happen second shot. It doesn't matter. You just, you keep that in. Like you're saying, you continue to advance yourself. And I, I think that's the most important takeaway is your path does not have to look anything like anyone before you, anyone after you, you know, everyone's path is so, it's such an individual experience. And really the the huge takeaway and something definitely that I've learned along the way is just, it's made you who you are today. And all of those things led into the person that eventually, you know, some admission committee thought, saw it off, off the paper, if you will, because really that's all, unfortunately, that most of them get to see. And something about your application, you know, spoke to them. And that's a huge takeaway because I just think the biggest thing, and I remember feeling this during that entire process was just, you know, oh, well, I must be doing something wrong because so many other people just had it easier or it just came easier or this is the way it was supposed to happen. And somehow I'm not the same way. It's not happening the same way for me. And and that's just, unfortunately, it's almost something you have to compartmentalize that thought because it's it's not a good thought to have. And it happens naturally, but really that's the big takeaway is it's okay. It's okay. And you have your goal and you're going to get there. And it doesn't matter all the bumps along the way. You just, you have that goal in mind. You just keep working towards it. And that's the best kind of takeaway, definitely, that I would share with anyone now. Thank you. And I think that an additional point that I know you'll agree with is that the number of times you apply, none of that defines you. It's so true. It's And, and unfortunately, while you're in it, while you're in the thick of it, that's all you think of because that's all you know is I have to have this GPA. I have to have this LSAT score. When it comes to bar time, the biggest thing that any student who's been sitting in a Starbucks or if that's you now, hang in there. But, you know, the biggest thing was, oh, I didn't read far enough today. Other people I've heard of, they got to chapter X. It doesn't matter. It's such an individual journey. And at the end of the day, everyone's there together. When you get to cut those letters to your signature line, it's a big deal. And all of those things really, it, it adds into what makes you you and why you're such an individual as part of, you know, a big group of people that get to call themselves, you know, you and I both get to call ourselves lawyer. But when it comes to even other people that we know and people that we consider mentors and who we used to go to for mm-hmm. advice about some of these huge milestones along mm-hmm. the way, their journey is night and day different. And we're we're all part of this big wide group of people, professionals known as lawyers, but everyone's journey is just so different. And it's so important. It's just so important to think one hurdle or one obstacle or even a million obstacles before you get to that finish line, if you will, which that finish line, as I'm sure doesn't exist, to, keeps moving. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as you reach each individual achievement and each goal that you put your mind to, that's the huge accomplishment. And that's what you should be so proud of. It's just getting to each different stage. And even just looking back at each separate goal, it's huge. It's huge. I mean, now thinking back, there's a few, right? It's that beast of an LSAT, like I called it, but it was. For me, it was the LSAT that was that constant roadblock. I felt great about my grades. I, I felt like I was a strong candidate, but that LSAT, it was it was this elusive concept to me, right? And And that's something where I couldn't agree more that it, it doesn't mean anything and it, it shouldn't be the be all and end all. It's you will get there. You just put your mind to it and it'll happen. Yeah. And, you know, the score is not the only thing that schools look at either. It's marketed that way by companies. And we all know in our minds exactly what I'm talking about that do their marketing based on the fact that they know that applicants have a fear of competition and this fear of failure. But it's not the only thing. Does it matter? Yeah, it's a factor. But what else matters? Who you are and your application on paper, because that really defines who you are and what you bring, your experiences, your values, your goals, what you want to do, what kind of impact you want to have, the good that you want to do. That's what defines who you are and what you become. And of course, your goals can change. But 
it's not only about the LSAT. And I remember my husband, who's also a lawyer. Hi, Jonathan, if you're listening. I was studying. He was a lawyer long before I was. I was doing my PhD when we met. He, you know, I was stressed out studying for the LSAT like everybody else. And he said to me, I know lawyers who totally did not get even the average score on the LSAT, but who were admitted. And that sort of put things into perspective for me because it's not about the score. It is about like, it's a factor, but it's not just about that. And and similarly, once I got into law school and I started, you know, having to deal with the curve and all of the sort of politics and social dynamics that come along with the curve, I had another discussion with him and we then talked about how we both know lawyers who didn't get those A's, but who are amazing lawyers. And it's so funny that you say that because I remember while I was working at the firm and I was with lawyers that I, to this day, consider these are the people that I say in 15, 20 years when I get to that year of practice, I want to be as seasoned as some of these individuals that I'm so fortunate enough to consider my mentors and I can go to. And I've run into them. If you think of the breakout room at one of these facilities that we use in in our areas of law. And the funniest thing is I'll never forget a few of them used to laugh, laugh and say, seize, get degrees. And I used to think, how crazy is that? There's no way. There's no way that that's possible because I know you have to have a certain GPA and a certain LSAT score. And even I remember the score, the score just being everything that you focus on. And it's funny in retrospect, but while you're in it, that's all you're thinking. And I'll never forget the first year of law school. And when you start talking to people, it's almost like that's one of the first questions. It's where, what did you do for undergrad? What did you get on the LSAT? And as you leave that entire bubble and you start working, no one, no one will ever ask you. And I know now there's all these memes going out in social media with similar hilarious questions because it just doesn't matter. You've nope, gotten no to one a cares. point then that the score is nothing. And I mean, most of the time it's, oh, the LSAT. And I remember finally getting into law school and finding out there were, I had a a very good friend of mine from law school that I met. I was so fortunate to meet him. And I remember it was his, you know, multiple times he had applied and the LSAT, it was, I kept, he kept saying, there's no way I should never have been let in. Like I didn't even get a score. That's like, even like you don't say it out loud because it's so, it's so, and it's, and it's hilarious. It's hilarious to think of in retrospect now, but in the moment, I mean, that's, you thought these two things were like the biggest obstacles that you were going to face. And it's funny that you say that, though. And, and sometimes it's so helpful to know from people that, you know, later on you meet these people and they just tell you the realities. And, you know, you and I sitting here, it's funny because even if we were to meet, you know, that summer student or that articling student now, I would, I would 100% say the same thing, you know, don't worry about it. Just do what has gotten you to this point because it got you here. And just keep doing you and keep pushing yourself. But just that competition, that comparison, it's, you know, sometimes it's like that's going to be our own, you know, our own stumbling block is we almost put it in our own path. And and it's funny because you hear that from so many people. It's just they, they laugh about it after the fact. You know, you don't have to have the straight A's. You don't have to have the 171 LSAT score. It's, you know, it just it doesn't mean it doesn't mean what you think it does when you're in it in that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. And then I remember the day that I learned that there were some people who I knew who didn't get a great score and the school that they ended up getting into decided to hold an interview to interview them because of their letters, because of their personal statements and schools, law schools, at least in Ontario, there are some exceptions now. But at the time that I applied, schools did not hold interviews. And so I was shocked to learn that. And so really the letters and and your written statements, your written personal statements, your autobiographical sketch, your references, those really matter because I know of examples where schools said, we don't care about the fact that we don't regularly hold interviews. We want to interview this person and those people got in. And so it's so important that we just take a step back and we demystify this process that is so unnecessarily secretive. and. Really, it breeds this level of competition and scarcity mindset that holds people back. It's so true. It's so true. This this, this fear that, you know, oh, I'm just I'm not going to be good enough or you can't openly share. You know, it's funny that you and I from the one of the first conversations we had it, I think it just happened to come out that, oh, yeah, well, I wrote the LSAT a couple of times. Oh, me too. <laughs> and we laughed about it because it wasn't 
anything, I mean, granted, we met, we were at slightly different stages of, you know, that legal journey, but it wouldn't matter, you know, even myself, when I meet new colleagues and we're similar, you know, years as lawyers and, and whatever the case, it's, you, you think less of it as I need to be the best or else rather than, you know what, this is a colleague and how can we both help each other to build each other up? And I think that when you take a spin and you stop worrying, because of course, that's the biggest concern is, but I have to beat these other applicants because how else am I going to get in? And then once you're in, you realize, wow, these are some people that, I mean, I can grow from some of these individuals and how, how some of these friendships they just turn into. And, you know, it's funny because we're sitting here today where, in fact, we're like two examples of how you can meet someone in one kind of stage or one aspect. And it's just, it's these individuals and these people that you, they're just so monumental. So sometimes when you think of your journey, it's, I can't even imagine, you know, sitting here, I could say, I can't even imagine being presently where I am without, you know, you personally, Adrian, but even like you and your husband, you know, you were both my sounding board for a good chunk of my journey. So it's just so funny. It's so funny that way. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so let's, talk about some of those application processes. So first, and this application process happened before we met, your application to law school. So maybe you can tell me a bit about your, and and reflect a little bit on how you felt during the application time, actually working on your application, sitting there alone and just having this blank piece of paper in front of you. How did you feel? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was grueling to say the least. I, I don't think anyone enjoys applications. I definitely did not. And this was, yeah, I mean, at that time, you hear, you know, you knew at what, when I applied, it was all about the personal statements. And when I had applied, I also applied outside of Ontario. So other provinces required every application, really every institution has a little, has a little spin on what they're looking for and putting yourself in that mindset where you have to explain what makes you you to this school, to a panel of people that you're never going to, at least when we applied, you know, I think both of us have the same experience where there were no interviews. It was just, it was your written, your written interview, if you will, where here is who Fran is on paper. And please, please, please accept me into your school. And it, it's grueling. It was definitely grueling. I remember, you know, you would do all the searches. You would look up, you know, sample statements. You spoke to, you know, hopefully you were lucky enough that maybe even, and some of you listening, maybe you have individuals you know, and they're able to provide you with maybe even a copy of what their sample was. And I remember sometimes that was even worse. I know personally, because reading someone else's and, and seeing, oh my goodness, how many other things this individual has achieved. And then what am I bringing to this law school? And I think the hardest part really is being able to, to really put pen to paper and really get into like, who, who am I? And what will I bring to this law school and how do I bring what this law school I know is known for or large areas that this that this particular school focuses on? And it's super scary. I think the biggest thing is you're just it's so much fear, so much fear. And then constantly thinking, oh, but am I going to be good enough? A am I going to is this even going to work first time? What happens if I don't get in? And you're you're almost putting yourself in a negative space even before you get there. And. And it's really tough. I mean, I was definitely not someone who knew. I didn't know anyone in law school when I had applied. I had some friends. They ended up going to the States. It was very different. It's a very different application. And just our experiences were just so different. And I didn't have that lucrative, that, oh, I'm incredible LSAT score. And so I was just riding on the academics alone. I wasn't. I, I wanted to t explain to the committee this is who I am and this is why I'm a good fit for you. And it, and it was just the grueling task of having to take one statement. And then I always say massage it, massage it and massage it until you ended up with, you know, six, seven, eight different statements for different schools. And it was, it was definitely tough. I was always very hesitant to have anyone read them. I just, I always was so nervous. What if someone thinks, well, that's it? Like, well, you're not going to get in with this. And it was, I, I think the fear really, it's something that you almost have to put on an aside. Don't let that stop you. Just get that pen, get that paper and just write it down. Or I mean, now with all this technology, you were always typing everything, but just, just get started because once you get started, resources like apply yourself. I mean, it was unheard of when I was doing my application. Even a podcast like this, where people get to talk about 
this is what the experience is like. You just, I don't know. I, I know personally, I just always thought maybe I'm the only one that feels like this. Maybe all these other people, they just had so much going on that they could just put all these glorious things on paper. And it just wasn't what I was feeling. So really getting a good sense of what makes me me and how am I going to put that in a nice, perfect little package that this admission committee is going to say, we're going to, we're going to take a shot on this one. Yeah. And I, for all of those reasons, I, it's so important. I take the work that I do here so seriously because like this is your life. And when my clients come to me, I know that the work that we're doing together is setting them up for their entire futures. And so this is one of the biggest reasons that, and also because I've been through the processes myself, that we don't focus on the competition, right? Focusing on them ends up being a complete waste of our time and mental energy. We focus on you and putting that package together that is polished, that you're proud of, that you're confident in, and that really speaks to you that could be no one else's, is not cookie cutter. Like, There is nothing about your application that will be the same as anybody else's. Yours will be unique to you because you are a unique person, different from everybody else applying. And that's true for everybody. We just have to pull it out of you. Yeah. And that's definitely, I, I think that's the biggest thing. I know, you know, take us down a few, a few steps forward. I mean, I can say personally, that's exactly what. I was have I was struggling. I was struggling. And I I remember even at the time of doing the applications, I wish I had Adrian. I wish I had someone like that who had gone through it, who someone who could really exactly like how you say, pull out these good bits. But sometimes it's so hard to look inward. I think that's the hardest thing to do. I mean, I could help someone else write a glowing personal statement about themselves, but to write it about yourself, it it's just it doesn't come as naturally. It definitely doesn't. So This is a huge resource. Apply yourself. Just you, you being at the forefront and you being someone who can relate to these experiences. It doesn't matter if it's a totally different, you know, application. It doesn't have to be law school or, you know, anything else. It's, it's the application itself. It's, it's similar skills and similar things that come out of it. And I think that's why, I mean, I always say, you know, I'm, I'm a number one fan, but I'm biggest supporter because it's a real testament to just that you yourself. And then what apply yourself in hindsight, I wish there was something like this that I knew of. And maybe there was, but just you didn't know about it and you didn't know about it to use it to really craft and and help you through it because it's a rough time. And as a student, you're already stressed. You just graduated. Sometimes you're doing this even before most of the time, actually, before you've even graduated. So you're still trying to get the good grades, deal with undergrad or whatever stage you're at to get to that next level. And you're so stressed across multiple areas of your life, let alone your personal life with whatever you're dealing with as a person (laughs) separately from academia or professional life. And then you have to take that next step and it's just everything working together. But it's definitely, I mean, that's huge. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is just, you know, it's such an individual and unique experience who you are. And it's it's putting away, like just put it that thought completely aside that there's any comparison that needs, there's not. You and the next person are always going to be night and day different. And there's reasons why both of you would make stellar, stellar assets to any school, any program, anything that you're looking to do. So, and I think that's why it's all about, it's all about looking inside. Okay, who are you? And what makes you you? And what has gotten you to this stage? And that's why the first thing that I do in any work that I do with clients is the reflective mindset, looking inward work. And I know from my from my clients, and we'll talk about your experience with this in just a moment, that my clients are able to use the looking inward work, the mindset work that we actually document at the very beginning of our work together. They use that in all of their applications, even beyond working together. So you've like really hit the nail on the head there that it, that this process is so informed by looking inward. And that is really scary to do. It's hard. No one, no one loves that work, right? You, you can get very good at it. I practice it, but it does take practice. It's a skill. Definitely. And it's not something I think that comes naturally to most. When you get into that situation where, and I can imagine, you know, I mean, I know how it is when you're like, okay, so what is it about you? What is it like? Just talk to me now. Tell me a few things about you. And it's, it's easy to say I'm sitting on your couch and you and I are eating some sushi and we're having this conversation. But that's, I think the best part about it is working with you. It takes this 
it's so informal and you can really get into that mindset. And then once you're there, you look at things that I think you would have even looked at totally different if someone wasn't there kind of helping you <laughs> pick out these nuggets, if you will, you know, these these important little parts. And then when you put all those parts together, it's here you go. At least for my experience, it was OK. Well, yeah, that's Fran. <laughs> that that sounds good. And I'm, I'm happy with this product. Right. And And that's that it is, that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal because it, it's so true. It, you're not, just not used to practicing that, you no, know, looking inward, right. really picking out all these highlights about yourself. It, it's difficult to do. <laughs> exactly. So this is a great transition to your change in career path and how that led us to sitting on my couch, eating sushi and looking inward. So let me maybe begin by like setting the stage for this story, which is that you told me you were ready to switch fields. And I'm going to ask you a bit about that in just a moment. But I said, tell me a bit more about this. But you hadn't updated your resume in quite some time because luckily you didn't need to for a very long time. And you said to me, like, I haven't done this in so long. I said, oh, like, come over. I can help you. And I didn't tell Fran that I was running Apply Yourself for years already. I didn't tell her that I had any clients. I didn't tell her that this is what I do or part of what I do at the time. And you came over, you brought your laptop. I opened up mine. I started to ask you these really meaningful questions in order to pull out what you needed, the, the, the mindset and the skills that you needed in order to begin to draft your cover letter and resume for this brand new application cycle to new firms, new companies in order to advance, in order to actually switch fields. So there we are sitting on the couch working together. You didn't know that I did this for a living. And, and so we began to actually work through my process. So without having known that I did this at the time, can you maybe reflect on the transition and what it was like to actually work with me one on one in this capacity, even though you didn't know really <laughs> what yeah, you were clue. engaging in at the time. Not a clue <laughs> at all. Yeah, definitely. I mean, at the time too, I had been very fortunate. And just like you said, I, I was, I was very lucky. I was able to get some incredible opportunities along the way, but. One of the big ones is, particularly when you're a law student, the big deal is, you know, getting some summer student positions for the summer months. Later on in your final year, once you're done school, you secure an articling position. And the big hoopla, if you will, during law school was, oh, this on-campus interviews. And when you're not in Toronto, so at the time I was in Ottawa and I had a lot of friends who were participating as part of this process, it's basically the traveling to and from Toronto from wherever you're going. And it's numerous firms that have set up these interviews. It's a huge deal. I remember in Ottawa, it was all you could talk about as a student. And it started even before you started your last year of law school. And I was so fortunate. I got to watch from a distance my friends go through this really traumatic experience, yeah. really, at all a at all avenues. It's just, just very, I mean, you're talking about some of the top Bay Street firms. And again, it's this idea of that's the, that's the standard. That's the gold standard. And you want to get there. And then you start hearing all these mumblings about, oh, you know, they only take like three students, but there's over hundreds of applicants, let alone if you even get one interview out of the initial process. And then there's callbacks and just the whole thing sounded really scary. And I remember I was fortunate enough. I was very lucky when I was a summer student. I was actually one of my mentors had approached me and he was taking on a new role as a managing partner. So he had brought me to this new firm. And that's where I was able to do my second year summer and as well as my articling term. So as part of that, I mean, I had worked in the same kind of area since being a summer student and really since before law school. So I had worked in the same type of law, same field of law, and I had loved it. And I got to a point I remember, and, and that's really what gets us to your couch, is I had gotten to a stage where I feel like at the firm I was at, I was looking for a change. I was also so scared. You know, I was very comfortable. I, I think there comes a point, though, where that becomes much more, if you will, almost like a security blanket. You know, I loved what I did. I loved the people I worked with. Thinking of leaving was so scary. And then 
the biggest fear and for sure what it was going through my mind is, but what happens if I make this transition and it doesn't work? And then how do I come back to my old boss and say, oh, can I come back to you? And and it was just, it was so scary. And along that journey, I think the biggest thing was I was very fortunate. I had gotten that one interview when I initially got in in this boutique firm and I was interviewing as a legal assistant. And from that time, I didn't need a resume. And I, again, I am so lucky, but I didn't. I didn't, I had not applied professionally as now I'm now a lawyer and I need to have a professional resume and a professional cover letter. I mean, my resume was what I had tweaked to some extent, obviously, when I had, I was in the midst of, I finished an undergraduate degree and it was in that between period of, of getting into law school. And so, you know, I'm at this firm now and I'm really, I'm really struggling with, you know, do I make the transition? Do I, do I switch gears now? There were big things happening in the background. So you're always hesitant, you know, is now a good time? Maybe I should wait. Maybe I should just stay put. I'm doing well. I like what I do. Like really, do you really want to change? And I'll never forget. I had met up with a lawyer that I had worked with years before. And I remember he had told me, you know, it's not about saying goodbye to any opportunity. I mean, you will keep those those people and those people will continue to be sources of constant knowledge and how to's along the way. But, you know, the biggest thing he had told me is there comes a point, I think, in in your professional career where maybe you've gotten what you can from this one opportunity. And maybe it's time to start looking, you know, how can you continue to advance yourself? How do you continue to push? And that's where we were at, where I ended up on your couch. I was ready. I was ready to make that transition, but I was so scared because I had not, I didn't even know what a professional resume looked like. And I remember saying, I don't even know the process. I I mean, I had such an informal way that I had gotten to where I was at that I don't know. I mean, how do I interview now at a, at a totally different firm with, you know, another managing partner and, and senior level associates? And, and I think the biggest thing I can say about just the process, you know, like you said, we were both sitting on the couch with our laptops open and you would ask me kind of a more open-ended question. And I remember some of it just as simple as, okay, so talk to me about what your day-to-day tasks are in in your jobs that you're doing. And at the time that I was applying, even just the way I would describe it, but then how you would rephrase the skill that came out of that daily task that I didn't think anything of. And just the way you would have me look at it at a totally different lens. And I think that really is how it continued to develop where then it turned into a resume and what are your skills and what would you bring to a different firm and let alone the cover letter itself, which was even, it almost took me back. It was like pre-law school days with, okay, it's a personal statement. You're really telling a firm, this is what I bring to the table and this is why it would be a good fit for you and your lawyers and your team. And what do I, what will I help this firm advance in terms of what the firm is already maybe known for or what area of law I wanted to get into? It's that looking inward. It's, it just is not, it doesn't come as naturally as you would think. That's everything that went into that application. And that's everything that, you know, really, And it's funny to say sitting here now that Apply Yourself was up and running. And I just thought I was talking to one of my closest and dearest friends. And she was just so helpful. And I remember it's so funny that you say that because I remember you mentioning to me, yeah, you know, I do this. I do this with students. And at the time, you know, you had told me about your PhD and, you know, you were working obviously one-on-one and things with other students at the time as part of your, as part of your doctorate. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, you know, okay, well, she's just helping me like she does all these wonderful other people and not knowing that it was anything close to, you know, I'm, I'm getting a service here from, you know, someone who knows what they're doing. It was, it's just so funny to think about, you know, now that, oh my goodness, you know, apply yourself. It's not a new concept. It was already there at the time, but you were just such a good friend that you did it out of the goodness of your heart. But, but really, I mean, I really, the one thing I would say to anyone is just, Sometimes it's the smallest thing, you know, just a cover letter uh, for myself. I mean, having someone like you that can sit and just make it such an individual experience. And let's see, you know, how to highlight things about you. And how are we going to put that into these couple paragraphs that it really, it makes one applicant shine. How can we frame this as, you know, okay, well, this is Fran and this is what Fran will bring to your firm. Yeah. And the job application process for you to switch fields was a really intense one. It was a really yes. intense one with lots of rounds within it, with interviews, our work in quotes, because you didn't know that that's what we were doing. But our work, it continued from the cover letter because you kept advancing. 
in the interview process, you kept being preferred candidate, preferred candidate, preferred candidate. So then we also worked on the interview because you also hadn't interviewed since way back when. So tell me about that experience for you. Yeah, oh my goodness. No, it's true. Yeah. The, at the last time I had interviewed, it was a very different type of experience only because it was also that first job. All I wanted was to work at that law firm. So I was, I can't even imagine that I could eloquently speak properly. And I was changing career paths. And it was a huge deal was, you know, preparing for an interview where I remember thinking one of the main questions for sure is going to be, well, like, why come to the other side? And the way we think of it is, you know, why defense work? And what is it that you bring now to defense work? And I remember saying, and I'll never forget, I was up sitting beside you. And I said, I don't know, what what am I going to say to that question? You asking me, what do I bring? In my mind was like, Fran, you are the one teaching me how to draft. Like you are the one teaching me these skills. Like I was an articling student working under you. We were like amazing friends very, very quickly and continue to be. But like sitting there with you, you asking me like, what do I bring to the table? I was like, oh my God, you are like a gemstone. Why can't you see it? And so really that's like, it was such a process of me being like, Fran, this is what is amazing about you. And here is like everything about you that's amazing. And really pulling that out and being able to put that on paper together was really a fulfilling process for me because I realized in that moment that you didn't see what I saw and I could help you, right? Like, and I was so happy to support you because you so deserve everything that came your way. And you worked so hard, like you work so hard. We work hard, but then you, you know, you see, you see somebody who you look up to, like I was a summer student under you and I saw so much value, like you helped me develop as a lawyer. And so then for you to be sitting on my couch saying to me, like, what do I bring to the table? I was like, oh my gosh, like, where do we even start? And so then as we're preparing for the interviews in this question of what do you bring to the other side of the table. So when you're switching from plaintiff to defense work, what do you bring? It was just such an important, I think it was such an important moment for me to really focus on that inner reflection for you because there was so much that you bring to the table. There is so much that you bring to the table that I I just needed you to realize. (laughs) I just needed you to see it. (laughs) So that was the beginning of like a very, very long conversation that I think happened over over like not just on one day, but a few different times in order to actually get to the place where you could give yourself credit for everything that you bring to the table, no matter what side you're on. Yeah, it's it's so true. And I remember I could list skills. I could say things, but it was just so difficult to think, well, yeah, like why defense? Like, why am I making this change? And I remember thinking that had been in my, on my mind for quite a time, you know, and it's funny because in our industry, this industry that I'm in, especially, you know, where we talk plaintiff and defense, this is a very fluid, it is a very fluid transition. It's not as uphill of a road that I kind of let it, I made it out to be for myself that, oh, it's such a, it's such a large transition. I mean, for myself, it was, it was a big deal making that switch at that time, especially just the application itself and getting that professional resume and that professional cover letter ready, but also yeah, definitely preparing for the interview and, you know, having some some questions and then myself feeling confident enough that, you know what, no, I can't speak from this and I can I can share about these skills and that's how it translates into what I can do, you know, on the other side of the table. And actually it happens a lot is you do say, you know, I've worked on that other side. I know that lens sometimes it helps me do a better job because I can say, you know, listen, if I was in that seat, this is what I would be saying to us. So I can almost anticipate and then defend at the same time, you know, and then think of, okay, well, then what would be a strategy to get over that? And at that time, when we're sitting on the couch, I couldn't even put together (laughs) those kind of thoughts together. So having this kind of a resource and just apply yourself having it and really what comes from it is having you and having you sit and pull out and parse out all these things and then you add them all together. Well, that is you. It's such an incredible opportunity and something to be able to have people really like like having someone like you on your side and working with me. Now I'm deciding to 
change my path and you know that ever evolving finish line where where does that take us having someone like you in your corner that can really highlight some of the things that you take for granted sometimes and you think like it's just a regular task but in fact it translates and no well this is how you're going to sell yourself this is how you're going to continue to advance because of what has led you to where you are now exactly exactly and you got the job i did yes. you got it yes. you got it Everything went swimmingly. You switched fields. You got the job. And so can you remember before we started, quote, working together (laughs) to after, how did the way you felt about yourself change before and after? Yeah, so definitely before, I mean, really, the biggest thing was it was just you were constantly, I was constantly in my own head, right? The big, the big fear. And like I had said earlier, it was the big deal was what happens if I make the change and then it doesn't work? And it's that almost the fear of getting started stops you in your tracks yes. and, and it shouldn't. And, and it shouldn't because it's not always a straight line, even to get to your chosen, you know, professional career. But even what that career looks like, it, it just, it's ever evolving. And so sometimes I thought too, okay, well, okay, if it doesn't, well, you just keep at it, you know, just because maybe one interview okay, that interview, maybe that's not the one that was meant to be. Maybe you were supposed to do three, four, five different jobs. And then you get to that job where you're there and you're like, this was it. This is well, this was well worth the wait. And for myself, I know, you know, I was very fortunate. It, it ended up, it was that interview. And then I was, I, I got the job and it was, it was great. And I presently, you know, I'm so happy. I'm thrilled that I made that switch when I did. But it's those feelings, I think, during the process, especially of working together, it's more, don't think in the negative. What do you bring to the table? Well, you've just listed all these skills and all of these things are something you would continue to use in these new positions. Just because you're changing side doesn't mean the skills are different. You're doing the same work just for a different aspect of the same case. And then you can take it and run with it. Once once you feel good about, okay, this is, you know, and for myself personally, it was, this is my resume, but this is the cover letter. These are the couple paragraphs that say, this is where I've been before. This is where I am now. And this is why I want to work with you so that I can do this as my future continues to go. And as I continue to advance myself through your firm and through the opportunities that, you know, I hope to have and hope to get through working at this new area. And it's definitely just that confidence building and working alongside you as well. It's all the prep work. I mean, as much as interviews are scary and you you're going to be nervous and it's inherent in the interview itself. I mean, I had a panel of three individuals, not mine. And, and I remember the managing lawyer at the time was one of the people interviewing me. And I was like, Oh, this is like the most important person. <laughs> it was a big deal. And, and I had lawyers that now, I mean, one of them, especially what ended up being one of my direct managers. It's strange because I mean, you're nervous. It, it's the interview, but you felt good because all the work that you had put in to get to that interview, you were able to use. And then it almost came as, you know, second nature. Oh, well, of course I could talk about now what my skills are. And because I've had to do this work constantly to get to that interview stage. So that's definitely, I think the feeling, the big thing was definitely the confidence and just working on those skills, but working on them over a period where you get to that next step. And for me, it was that interview where that's really where you got to feel Oh no, I know this. Like I can, I can answer these questions because this is something that Adrian made me do while we were sitting and putting everything, you know, pen to paper and, and, and putting that resume and the cover letter together. Yes. And it's no, it's no joke. Like it's a hard process. And these are hard skills to develop that actually take a lot of mindful work, like a lot of individual work. And so, you know, huge kudos to you for for putting in that work and getting that advancement that you sought out. You worked so hard during that process and in all of our, you know, get to, you know, whenever we got together to work on this and our phone calls and everything, you know, our late night calls and, you know, because we're both like at work till real late. (laughs) So, you know, being able to actually take the time and actually tell yourself like, I am worth this. I'm worth it. I'm worth this time and energy. And, you know, we all put this time and energy into other people, but rarely into ourselves for you to actually put in that work. And this is the work that I do with all of my clients that, that we commit to with all of my clients. You know, it is hard work. And so just to be able to recognize that and, and the fact that we got 
to a place where now you can do it probably a lot more naturally. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, I think that's huge. I think it's, it's just so important where it's true. It's those skills don't go away now. Now it's that, you know, potentially down the road, who knows again, where that ever evolving career will go. It's that same, those same skills will come into play. If again, there's another transition or there's a totally different opportunity. You need to constantly be looking to continue to advance. And in the future, it's the same things that you're going to be looking at and having that in the back of your mind. It's, it's just a huge, it's just a huge benefit. So. Through these twists and turns, what have you learned? One of the biggest things I really think is feeling like there's this standard, this the way that it's done and comparing yourself. And we've talked about it through competition and stuff. And it's natural in a professional setting because there is competition. They don't take all the applicants. That's why there's an application and, and everything else. And that happens across the board in, in different stages. But I think the big thing is you set your eyes on something. You want to advance to a particular goal. You have a particular goal in mind and constantly just reminding yourself how you got to this stage, that's what worked for you. You don't need to change yourself to all of a sudden change how you do things because, oh, well, someone else had mentioned that that got them a better result or it got it quicker or more efficiently. There's no efficient way of going through how your life is going to pan out. I think at the end of the day, it's a big thing about being confident in yourself, being confident in this is how I've gotten here and this is how I will continue to advance myself. But it's not going to be rewriting who you are. It's looking at yourself and really thinking, OK, this is how I'm going to continue to do this, you know, in the future. And another thing I can't say enough is throughout all the turns and the weaves and as the journey has evolved and all of you listening, I'm sure you've already met incredible people, people that have come into your life, people that you've met either professionally, academically, personally. And for myself, especially, I know some of these individuals and really most of them to this day, I consider them mentors. I, I go to these people talking about anything really. It's so important, you know, as you continue to evolve, you, you might change paths like I did, or maybe you're just starting out and, you know, you're, you're networking and you're meeting individuals. It's, it's so important to just keep those relationships. You never want to burn any bridges and that, and that's huge for anyone, but you never know when some of these people, either from your past or someone to come in the future, when they're going to be able to present you either with an opportunity or through them, you're able to just go somewhere you wouldn't have even imagined for yourself. I mean, who knew that when I got to meet the summer student way back when at our boutique firm, that that would be, you know, that's Adrian, who's now has helped me in a in a totally different way than I could have imagined when we first met, right? It's 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 just, you just never know. So use all those avenues and just, you just don't know where life will take you. Yeah, I love that. It's so, it's so true. It's so true. So, okay, last question. What advice would you give your younger self? Wow. I mean, I would say a big one is just don't be afraid to get started. I think that's a huge one. I think, you know, I myself personally can definitely say it was a big factor. Always feeling like you just weren't sure if you could get there. This was something where I was, I was that young kid that had dreamt like, no, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to get there. And th there were some hiccups, you know, and, and I like to say, you know, it was just twists and turns. But I mean, at the time, I thought they were huge boulders in the middle of my path. And how was I ever going to move them? And talking to my younger self, I would just say, keep your focus on that goal. Just keep moving forward and keep advancing yourself and have that in mind. And you're going to get there. And it doesn't matter if you have to make a right turn, left turn, if you have to make a U-turn, you will get there and you will get there because you are determined and, and you totally deserve it. You, you deserve all this work that you're putting into it. It's going to, you're going to come out on the other side and one day you will look back and you'll laugh at it all. If I was thinking back to, you know, that undergrad student trying to write the LSAT and figure out, well, you know, what's next for law school, thinking back to myself and just, just telling myself, you know, you know what you want to do and you will get there. And it's okay. It's okay if the first time it doesn't work out. It's okay if the fifth time it doesn't work out. It doesn't matter. The number doesn't matter. It's how the journey gets you to where you end up. And I, I think that's that's the biggest thing I could I could say back to my young self. Buckle in because it's it might not always be the 
straight line that you thought for yourself, but it's totally worth it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have shared so much of your wisdom and so much value with us today. Thank you so much. And we have so much more to talk about. So I hope you come back. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for, for sharing and being open and honest and frank and candid with us. I so appreciate it. I know that we all do in the Apply Yourself family, which you are a part of. So thank you to anyone out there who's listening and see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at Apply Yourself Global and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.